All right, let's get started. So, uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Welcome back to the November 2019 edition of the A2 New Tech Meetup. Um, thanks for coming out, and I think we'll have some more people trickle in. I heard the traffic is a little bit bad tonight, so as people find parking, we'll probably get some more. Um, but I'm your host, David Nesbitt, and I help manage an ed tech incubator at U of M. And I'm happy to be here monthly with you guys, um, hearing pitches and helping build the tech community in Ann Arbor through this group. Um, so this meetup has been running for a long time. It's been running since, since 2009. Um, so it, uh, this is our 10th anniversary year, which is super cool. Um, we've had, since 2009, over 100 meetups, uh, over 350 companies pitch at this event. And we have around 7,500 members right now in the meetup group. And last year, we had almost 60 pitches. So it's a very active group. A lot of people are involved. A lot of people come through these doors um, to see pitches and um, to connect in this group. So we're glad that you're here tonight and maybe even for your first time. Um, so this is kind of a friendly front door for entrepreneurship in Michigan and especially for this area around Ann Arbor. Um, so every, every time, month we like to get a sense of kind of who's in the audience. And someone suggested last time uh, to kind of ask the different types of people that might be in the audience, have people raise hand and to give a little bit of time to look around and see the people that you might want to connect with. So <clears throat> raise a hand if you are currently an entrepreneur. Keep them up there, look around, you're trying to meet other entrepreneurs. What about um, if you're wanting to start a venture and you're not started yet? That's probably like everyone else in the room. <laughs> um, not necessarily. Okay, uh, what about investors in the room? Anyone bold enough to raise your hand if you're an investor? Okay, so we got um, Marketers in the room. People do marketing work. If you're looking for a marketer, look around those hands. How about designers? A couple there. And then software developers. Sweet. So take a look around, leave your hand up for a second, and if you're looking for any of those people, make sure to connect afterwards. We'll have our um, little time to chat after the pitches and after the community announcements in this room, and then we'll go to Pizza House after the meetup to connect more, and so make sure to talk to those folks who raise their hand uh, with the skill set that you're interested in. Um, so this monthly time lets us uh, get together to learn what's happening in the A2 tech community. So through pitches is definitely a big way that happens. It's also through our community announcements. So through our announcements every month, uh, we can learn about what are the events that are happening, um, who's looking for what collaborators in town, what jobs are being hired for. Um, so make sure to think of what your announcement is. And after the pitches, we'll call um, a line of people up. You'll line up in front of that whiteboard and then one at a time come up and make your one to two minute pitch. So keep that in mind now um, and start thinking about what that might be. But this group is a great way to meet the other people that are building and shaping the future of technology in Ann Arbor. Um, and so each of us has kind of our own goals for being here. They could really vary really broadly. Um, but I want to encourage you to also think about kind of the other people that are here tonight. You might come in with your own goals, but think about how you can help someone else out. Maybe give them a piece of advice or listen to them talk about their company. Um, just kind of be a, a listening ear um, or about their idea or what they're looking for um, or give them a connection that would be helpful. So think how you can do that with at least one person tonight. Um, that will make Ann Arbor's tech community just a more welcoming place and a helpful place for us all to be in. And then afterwards, make sure to join us at Pizza House, which is a few blocks away on Church Street, to eat some free pizza, courtesy of Ann Arbor Spark. In the next month, um, if you want to stay connected with some of the people in this room, and broad, more broadly beyond that, the Ann Arbor Tech community in general, the best place to do that in the meantime is our Slack channel. Um, Madeina2.com slash Slack is where you can join that. Um, Slack's a communication tool that's used that essentially allows all the people in the tech community in Ann Arbor to communicate in one place. Um, so you can share things that are like events that are coming up, jobs you're hiring for, um, anything that you want to share there that's really helpful for the community or that you're looking for feedback on from the tech community here. So that's madeina2.com slash Slack. And if you haven't checked out madeina2.com, it's also a helpful um, directory of some of the tech companies in Ann Arbor, as most of the tech companies in Ann Arbor on it. Um, and so make sure to go on there, helpful resources when you're looking for jobs or just trying to figure out who's in the area. So that's madeina2.com and slash slack if you want to find the specific slack page to join. So I want to say uh, a quick thank you to some organizations and people that make this event possible. We all benefit from uh, the end of our new tech meetup in different ways. And so these are some of the people and groups that have made that happen. A2 Geeks is a nonprofit dedicated to making Southeastern Michigan and Ann Arbor a great place for geeks and creatives to live, work, and play. Roger Rail does our video each month for our event, so let's give Roger a hand up here. So um, Roger's company, R2 Vive, you can hire them to do video work. Um, so look up R2 Vive on Google, that's R2 V-I-V-E, 
and you can find them there. And um, he'll also post a video from tonight's meetup as a comment in the meetup event page. So look for that afterwards if you want to find that or if you thought the pitch was really great and want to send it to someone else. Um, you can do that and you see the comment on the event page in the next couple days. Um, I also want to say thank you to some co-organizers of the group over time that have helped curate presenters, give feedback on pitches, things like that. Um, that's Doug Song, Zach Steindler, Scott Gosey, David Bloom, David Corcoran, Brian Kelly, Brooke Boyle. And these organizers have made this event happen for the last 10 years, which is uh, no small feat. It's not a huge amount of work every month, but it does take some work, and so these people have kept it going. Um, the entrepreneurship at U of M's law clinic, our uh, law school, help us get this space every month. Um, so that's really helpful. We wouldn't be able to do this if we didn't have a big room, big enough to hold all of us. And so Dana Thompson is the founding director of Michigan Law's Entrepreneurship Clinic. Um, and the Entrepreneurship Clinic, essentially if you're a company in Michigan, especially a, a startup, you can get free IP, corporate, and various legal services from U of M students. And you can contact Laura Schultz, the clinic, clinic administrator, to learn more about how uh, they can work with you. And then lastly, I mentioned our pizza this month is sponsored by Ann Arbor Spark. Ann Arbor Spark is committed to bringing together organizations and individuals to support the growth of jobs and companies in um, this area. So they're sponsoring a pizza at Pizza House. They've been doing this for quite a while now, uh, more than a year, probably coming up on about two years now. And so we really appreciate them supporting in that way. All right, do we want a music recommendation this month? Yeah. I know a couple of people have asked about the music recommendations. It's been about, it's been a long time since I've shared one, but I like to do this. Music is a big part of my life and one of my favorite things to do. Brian Kelly, who used to organize, we give podcast recommendations. I don't listen to as many podcasts to have a new one every month for you guys. Uh, but a group that I went and saw a concert in Detroit last week, I wanted to recommend to you, it's called the Cinematic Orchestra. Some of you might know the song To Build a Home, or if you heard it, you might recognize it. That's a very popular one, but um, in general, they're a UK group that does kind of like new jazz. Um, and it's really interesting. They have a mix of instrumental things that are more cinematic. They also have um, like vocals and things like that. Highly recommend you check them out. They have a new album that was out. Um, and they essentially are two guys that do music with a uh, group of different musicians they collaborate with. So if you look on their Spotify, you see a ton of different artists' names that they've done songs with. Highly recommend. These are true artists. It was a fantastic show. And if you can see them live, I highly recommend it. So that's the Cinematic Orchestra. OK, agenda for tonight. We're going to jump into pitches in a second here. We'll be going until about 8 PM. And we'll have five companies pitching tonight. They'll do a five minute pitch and then a five minute Q&A afterwards. I'll have a timer running down here to keep them to the five minutes. Um, so if you're pitching tonight, make sure you watch that timer. I'll gently cut you off if you get to that five minutes and are still going. Um, after that, we'll have the community announcements time. So make sure to think about that. I'll call you up um, when it's time for those. And during the Q&A portion after the pitches, one of the things we ask is that after each pitch, there'll be a Q&A portion for that presenter. And so we ask that you, uh, anything you contribute during that time be in the form of a question. So raise your hand, we'll call on you, and then ask a question. Make sure to make it not just like a piece of feedback um, or you know, conversation, but you can have that afterwards with them. So that's a great thing about the networking time afterwards. So please ask it in the form of the question so they can respond and engage the rest of the audience and really give, them the, give the whole group something to benefit from. Last thing I'll say is silence your phones. Make sure to turn those off so they're not ringing in the middle of someone's uh, pitch that they've worked very hard on. And if you're tweeting or using Instagram, make sure you use the hashtag A2NewTech. All right, are we ready for these pitches? Yeah. All right, let's bring up Mark Instead from Hydro Labs for our first pitch. And so Hydro Labs is identity link solutions to simplify blockchain. Um, and while Mark's getting set up, I'll tell you an interesting fact about their company that some of their team members for Hydro Labs haven't actually met each other even after working together for over a year. So they all work remotely from different parts of the globe, including Asia, Europe, North America, and Africa. So this is kind of like the definition of a modern tech startup. So we'll let Mark take it away. All Do I have like a mic or am I just kind of talking? You can just talk. They'll hear you. All right. Yep. Cool. And do I just use the button as a clicker? Correct. Yep. All right. Cool. How's it going, everybody? My name is Mark Ansed. Um, I work with a company called Hydro Labs, and I'm here to talk to you today about how we are building different types of identity linked solutions to simplify blockchain. So a little bit about us. Uh, we built an entire platform, which is, an, is all open source and allows for any type of developer to build any type of identity-driven application, decentralized application, API, and even smart contracts. And this is all built using the ERC-1484 Digital Identity Standard, 
which is essentially an interoperable digital identity. On the product side of things, we are focusing on different types of solutions that revolve around payments, remittance, uh, non-custodial uh, storage, as well as um, different types of identity and document-related management. And all of these solutions are all built and tied to this core digital identity. So when you're talking about these new innovative solutions, especially buzzwords around blockchain, um, there are definitely very many barriers to adoption, one of which is these products are very hard to understand. And anyone who has never heard of blockchain, you're probably like, what the heck is this guy even talking about? And then again, these customers have to learn how to use something entirely new. And that's probably one of the biggest pain points when you're coming to a new technology. You have to have these customers spend time to actually learn how to use this product and then go about on their beautiful day. And right now, many of the blockchain products out there, they're very clunky and they have a lot of friction points for use on a day-to-day -day basis. So now bringing out, I guess you can consider it the solution. So at the protocol level, we built this entire foundation which allows for a financial services ecosystem to be built on top of it. And that brings in the product layer. And we have two, I'm sorry, three flagship products that we have been focusing on and building, which are HydroPay, HydroVault, and HydroDrive. And as you can see, all of these different types of solutions are built and tied to this core digital identity. So HydroPay, this product is actually already live and available. And it is the first permissionless, gasless, P2P payment solution on the market. We've also been working on an implementation with Omisego Network, which enables for instant and scalable transactions, as opposed to just regular transactions operating on the Ethereum network, which can get a little bit slow. And every single time a user is onboarded, they are given a unique and customizable Hydro ID. And this is your digital identity. And then this digital identity is able to be interoperable with basically any product that we are interacting with. So all the data and information can be easily communicated. And then further updates into the solution will enable for point of sale transactions as well as invoicing. In the V2 or 2.0 of HydroPay, we will enable four different types of remittance payments. So that means when a person is going and sending, let's say, uh, USD into Mexico, they are able to take their U.S. dollars in the U.S. and that is converted into a USD backed and pegged digital asset which can essentially be sent to anyone anywhere around the world. So it would be sent from USD into this digital asset to the person receiving it, in this case Mexico, and then they can withdraw that into Mexican pesos. <coughs> HydroVault, this is a product that we are currently working on in internal QA right now, and it is the most secure uh, non-custodial wallet on the market, so it requires no hardware whatsoever. It is also the first wallet with two-factor authentication built directly into the smart contract. And so a smart contract allows for all of these funds to actually be stored inside of it. And let's say, for example, you lose the key to your wallet, or a hacker steals the key to your wallet, I should say, <coughs> They can't actually steal any of your funds, and honestly, neither can we, because then the person who is trying to steal those funds has to additionally go through an authentication process to withdraw any of those funds. Finally, HydroDrive will begin working on this this coming year, and this is a file management system, whether it's for identity-related documents or just any type of document in general. And this allows you to store, sign, or even stamp any type of document and have it be stored safely on an IPFS node, otherwise known as a decentralized public chain. This is a little bit about our go-to-market targeting. Uh, some of our core team members, uh, myself, Marco, Jason, and Tim, and uh, look forward to some of your questions or asking about what blockchain even is. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, questions for Mark? Back in the right corner. Uh, the first time I tried to use Venmo, it was to pay my sublet rent to a student who had gone abroad, mm -hmm. and Venmo wouldn't allow someone to receive a payment if they were out of the country. 
So if you're talking about converting between two different country uh, currencies, um, how are you going to do that? And typically, the other application can't take funds if that person is out of the United States. So when you're dealing with Venmo, that is entirely fiat based. So let's say, for example, when you're using Venmo, you can't use that anywhere except in the US because all of the transactions on Venmo, they're entirely fiat based. None of the transactions on any of our products are revolving around fiat. So not only do we not touch the money, so when you're dealing with Venmo, all of those transactions, those are all custodial transactions. They're all done, um, I, I believe it's PayPal who owns Venmo, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but they control all of that money, so they can't allow for any transactions outside of the US. We don't touch any money whatsoever. We just enable this pipeline. So if someone is going and making a transaction, let's say from the US to anywhere around the world, we can't really stop them and we're happy that they do that. I mean, we have people who are using the product from basically all parts of the globe and we want them to be able to do that. We want them to have that type of freedom. So then if Venmo were to use your application to establish the pipeline, they could use their fiat base to digitally, physically move the funds along the pipeline? Um, somewhat. So when you're dealing with a blockchain or any type of blockchain based asset, um, it's very different from just a typical fiat currency. So when you're dealing with fiat currency, it's going to be like the US dollar, it's going to be the European euro, it's going to be the British pound. Those are all fiat currencies. We aren't necessarily transacting any of those with our products. All of those transactions with our products, they're all digital assets. And when we're dealing with uh, different types of remittance payments, so doing whether it's a P2P or even a B2B remittance, that is done from USD, from a bank account, to let's say into this digital asset, which can then be sent to the person in Europe. And then that digital asset is then withdrawn into, let's say in Europe, into the European Euro. Other questions? Back corner. So, how much time does it take to transaction to get transition? <coughs> uh, <laughs> It, it depends on what type of transaction. If it's just a, uh, like, these are all dealing with like digital assets and cryptocurrencies. So if you're dealing with a, a cryptocurrency, they can be done instantly. Oops. Um, if you're dealing with a fiat to fiat transaction, um, it depends on all of the functions within it. Uh, because if you're doing, let's say from uh, the USD, I'm just gonna keep using the USD to Euro, uh, let's say you're going USD and you're using the ACH transfer, which is free in the US, and that usually takes uh, two to three days for that to, to clear, and then that is swapped into a um, this digital asset, which is then sent instantly over to the person in Europe, and then that is withdrawn using typically a, a SEPA transfer. Uh, SEPA transfer. Other question, right? Who are your customers? Who are you mainly targeting with this? Um, yeah, just, sure. Uh, so no use case that was mentioned, but yeah, what's your sort of? Sure. So in the U.S., um, one of the I guess I'll go to our go to market page. Um, one of the big pilots that we are currently working on is how different types of merchants can enable to allow for payments within their brick and mortar stores. Um, so we are currently working on a pilot throughout uh, Colorado and Florida to enable for digital payments in basically every single recreational and medical marijuana shop. So all of those merchants, they're unable to get bank accounts. So when you're dealing with any of these products, you don't need a bank account. You're literally just going, you sign up, and you have this product that you're interacting with, and you can go send and receive transactions as you wish. And so let's say, for example, a person goes into that store they can go and pay using this app, which does an instant transfer using debit and credit cards into this stable digital asset, which the merchant can receive instantly. And that allows them to not only increase their sales and revenue, but it also makes it better for governments because they have paper trails and all of that, because they're all cash-based right now. Awesome, that's all the time we got, thank you.
Our next pitch is center spot. So Taylor Lancey is here to pitch center spot. Center spot's all about male empowerment. Sorry. So better center spot is all about female empowerment. <laughs> <laughs> We are developing a suite of software, including their flagship mobile application to mitigate the toxicity of the sorority recruitment process on college campuses. And a fun fact about Center Spot is that the original founding team met in a course at the University of Michigan. I'll show you just a second. Beautiful. Um, hey guys, I am Taylor Lancy, and I am a student at the University of Michigan. I am the CEO and founder of Center Spot LLC, which is a company for women and by women committed to promoting a simple and healthy sorority recruitment experience. So why does that matter? Um, basically, there are 1,200 women at the University of Michigan alone every year who go through this process and are told that they will be making a decision that will impact their entire college career and beyond. And that looks like four rounds, one of which is 17 houses in 48 hours, 25 minutes each, 10 minutes in between, in heels. And so these women are looking at paper products, different applications on their phone, and really trying to figure out what on earth is, is going on. And so that's affecting those 1,200 women at the University of Michigan alone each year. And expanding to the state of Michigan, that will be about 3,000 individuals as a compilation of different colleges and universities, and across the entire nation, over 150,000 women each year. And so we've broken up this problem into three parts. The first is taking notes. When I went through this process, I wrote down the word honey after talking to a house. I have no clue what on earth that meant. Did we talk about how we loved honey? How we hated how when people call us honey, called us honey? This girl was such a honey, I couldn't tell you. And after interviewing dozens of other women who went through the process, they shared the same sentiment. Another part of the problem is efficiency. So I mentioned there's a pamphlet with written down addresses, trying to input that into your map running a 20 minute walk in 10 minutes in heels. So there's really a lack of efficiency. And then lastly is values based. So there's so much toxicity and stereotype and stigma surrounding the recruitment process, but at its core, it's really about women joining a support network of other women. And so we're really looking to go back to that. So uh, our solution is for taking notes, there is a, a schedule that's populated into the first screen of the app per user per round. So there's a guided note taking process for that. Um, and then we have a two-pronged solution for efficiency. Number one is allowing users to drag and drop houses directly after they visit them for in-app ranking. And then also Google Map API implementation to allow uh, automatic route navigation from point A to point B. And then lastly is that values base. So each college or university gives a list of values that they want their users to choose from. And so then each user can have a pre-selected value that they can see after each house to avoid women saying, well, my best friend chose this house, or their living room was painted purple, and that's my favorite color. Um, so our customers, it's really B2B, so each university and each college would be purchasing authorizations for their users. So that would be a flat fee plus a $1 to $2 per user rate, um, depending on each university or college, so it's really customizable. A university like ours with, uh, with thousands of women going through the recruitment process needs a lot of different functionality than Muhlenberg College in Pennsylvania with only a couple hundred. Um, and so kind of where we're at right now is we had a fully developed contract with the University of Michigan, but unfortunately they're going through a lot of internal changes with the process this year. So we're kind of on hold for the time being. So we do have some conversations with uh, six other universities and colleges that were mentioned on the previous slide. And then we're in transition with our team. So we have some members who are graduating and we're really looking to um, add some more developers and build out a, a more robust team. And then in terms of scope, um, the application itself can really be applied to other aspects of the recruitment process, so whether it's um, the sororities, the executive team, or just integrating the Greek life community into the college campus, but also the company as a whole, we're really looking to expand to fit a larger mission, which is connecting young women in the tech and entrepreneurship spaces by one, strengthening support networks, two, increasing visibility, and three, empowering innovative collaboration. And what that actually means uh, thus far is we put on a event a couple of weeks ago that was called Her Empire, and we were, our mission was to inspire and connect collaborative, empowered, and fierce women on college campuses. And so in, in that, we had different female student organizations, female founders on campus come and create a physical and interactive space, uh, allowing people to come by and interact with us. And so looking forward, we're looking to have more events like that, but ultimately we're looking to really develop a suite of software that can align with this mission. So whether that is 
um, building support networks for women entering industry for that transition or building support networks amongst colleges or really anything in that space. So um, kind of the reason I'm here today is we're really looking to build out our team a little bit more, but also anybody with uh, industry or expert expertise, probably not in sororities, but in terms of female empowerment and the intersection between tech. Um, absolutely welcome comments, feedback, and time for questions. Thank you. All right, questions for Taylor, right here. I'm curious, what drove the, uh, what drove looking at uh, more or less partnerships with universities rather than the, say, end users themselves, having them download the app and use it more as a, you know, not necessarily having everyone use the app, but the people that wanted to. Yeah, so each university is so, so, so different. So ours is a very formal recruitment process, whereas I mentioned like Muhlenberg College, in Pennsylvania is a lot less formal, there's less users, and there's less of a formal process like we have. So it's a lot harder when you don't have a relationship with each university or college to know what that process looks like and what each user actually needs. So build, by building that relationship with the university, we can really um, customize that, the application to fit them. So for, you, for example, University of Michigan, we've been working with them for a year to make it so, you know, they're going from a change right now to fall to winter recruitment. So with the snow, doing recruitment in some university buildings, what does that look like? And that's going to be so different across different um, institutions. So really making sure that the, the experience that the user is getting is tailored to what they really need. Question right here. What feedback are you getting from the sororities? Um, or have you been in conversation with them or mostly just the universities themselves? Yeah, so what I'm kind of, the, this realm is like difficult to go into all the technicalities, but there's something called Panhellenic Exec, which is the executive board of all of the different sororities with representation. And so that's really who I'm in contact with, not like the university, but really that board at, the, at each university that is making those decisions. So the application right now is a result of user interviews with hundreds of women who went through the process, as well as like tons and tons of conversations with um, these boards to get it to make sure that it's fitting their process and their user needs. Other questions? Yes. Are you aware of any competitors? So when we started, no. And then with this kind of contract that we were building with the University of Michigan, they were looking for like kind of a quick and simple solution. So they are using temporarily a University of Michigan orientation application to kind of like kind of do what we did, but not really for like this semester. But in terms of anything that does what we do in terms of doing the starting recruitment experience, no. There's tons of applications that have to do with matching individuals or matching groups to other groups that could obviously go into this space, but right now in this kind of niche, I'm not aware of any other competitors now. Right. Is there, a, uh, it sounds like there's just like a one-time payment that goes into the application for girls to recruit. Is there other opportunities like in between that recruitment season and the next year to like have ongoing revenue and returning revenue for them? Yeah, so um, that's kind of like where we're starting is like each semester having that one-time payment, but then with the ability to expand to do things not necessarily having to do with recruitment, but also um, continuing that values-based programming throughout an individual's experience in that sorority would then have like monthly payments and be more of a relationship with the user, but that's kind of something that we are gonna do in the future in terms of expansion, just because we're trying to kind of get in the door first. What advice would you have for somebody who wanted to uh, negotiate a contract with the University of Michigan based off your experience? Um, don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk after kind of about that experience also. Very curious. So is there an opportunity on the sorority side for them to have a capability to connect in with this? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in terms of kind of expanding that scope, there is a lot of opportunity to have internal things within the sororities. There is opportunity to adapt this to the executive boards, um, to leadership within a sorority, to each of the members, and then also through the actual recruitment process of like how each sorority uses their own software right now 
to evaluate members that are walking through their door. And so eventually that would be something that we are kind of looking to other arenas, whether one is the actual strategies themselves and incorporating their evaluation into the larger kind of scope of what we're doing for the members who are going through the recruitment and then also on the administrative side, so the executive team that has to figure out scheduling and plan who's going where when, adapting it to their needs as well. Yeah. All right, that's all the time we got. Thank you. <laughs>
constantly, so they might be on call, they don't get a call for a day or a week, um, they might lose interest, uh, engagement, and then when somebody does call them, they won't answer their phone because they're not expecting the phone call. Um, so some of the things we're working on are just keeping in touch with the teachers more, developing a notification system so you know, a student can check if the teacher's available, send a text, things like that. Um, but as we, as we grow and have more students, um, hopefully that will balance out as long as we have the right ratio of students to teachers in there. Um, and then updates to the app. Um, I'm not a developer myself. I know a little bit about it, but it's really just myself and contracted third parties that are running the company and I have college interns and things. So um, really it's like development resources that we could use. Um, so we, I put together a, a plan, a financial plan, and I have an investor I'm meeting with this week um, on Friday. Um, but we have um, an estimate of about $22 million a month coming in in two years if we can grow at the rate we want to with the advertising plan we have in place. So it's a big financial opportunity. It'll take about a year to be profitable. Um, Looks like we're about up for time there, and um, that was it, so David, all right. Thank you. Questions for Mark? Over here. Yeah, so um, how much does it cost for this, and also, like, have you considered, like, pairing people who speak two languages that they want to learn together? Sure. Um, so, well, the cost, um, the first five minutes of the call is free, and then after that, the student pays by the minute, and it's about 40 cents a minute. Um, so there's no minimum duration, no con monthly contract, etc. cetera. Um, and considering having people pair up, um, there are programs that do language exchange like that. Uh, personally, I've tried to avoid that a little bit because um, I want it to be from a student's perspective, just pure convenience and they can just call someone and learn one way whenever they want without feeling an obligation to return the favor, um, just pay the money. So, I mean, that, that's an option worth considering, but we haven't done that yet. So. Uh, what's the stop? If I like say I have a call with someone and we have a fantastic call and it costs $10, and at the end I'm like, that was amazing. Can we talk every day? Here's my phone number. Um, what's to stop? Like, because then if I'm calling individually, Sure. Fluent has now cut out the equation. Is there like a protector against that? Um, yeah, people could do that. That's fine. Uh, really, the value in working with Fluent is that the payment is all built into the app. So you can do Google Pay, Apple Pay, credit card, <coughs> PayPal, etc. Um, so people could do that, but they would just have to have the trust established to, to um, send payment to each other from around the world. Yeah, maybe with our other guy here. Right here. <laughs> um, um, and then, you know, there's that. And then also, students learn a lot better if they speak with a variety of people. So we have, like, tons of teachers in there, and they're going to learn best if they speak with someone one day and the next day someone else. Ages, accents, those things differ. So, um, you know, that's possible, but not too concerned over it. Well, two things. One, I love how you speak with your hands, but two, how much do teachers make per hour? Um, teachers make about 70% of what the students pay, so uh, about $15 per hour if they're teaching. Nice. Yeah. All right, sure. sure. Uh, I saw that you were planning on using advertising to grow. Have you considered any other marketing channels or what's your strategy for growth beyond that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, Google, like app download campaigns work fairly well. I've tried that. Social media, like Instagram, Facebook, those work fairly well. Another thing I'm considering is partnering with like a Rosetta Stone or one of the, the businesses that don't offer this um, and then having them offer this to their students as a partnership there, like channel strategy. So, so yeah, open to lots of ideas. Question right here. Sure. Um, so we're in a university right now. So yeah. have you considered any partnerships with like university language programs and how might that work out if you have? Yeah, um, so just two weeks ago I presented at the University of Michigan to a room full of the language professors. Um, they're fairly interested and I've presented to the Spanish class a couple times here at Michigan. Um, the university students are less interested in like the live conversation practice than older folks. I've 
noticed because they just want to like pass their class but <laughs> before like an oral exam their teachers some have said like you know you should actually practice with a native speaker so yeah it's a good idea it's been working on that. question back Yeah, uh, well, we have about 700 students and 550 teachers now, um, but it's not like being used constantly, you know, the calls are, you know, maybe 10 calls a day, short calls, but they're not, I mean, there's a lot of room for improvement there, so, yeah, go ahead. Have you thought about a freemium model for driving traffic to your app? Um, have you, I mean, in, in the beginning, did you ever offer this just for free and pro bono? People that wanted to help out could hop on a call for five minutes to talk with them. I, mean, uh, I haven't offered it for free, but I do have some ads on the website, which I could make money from too. Um, I'm just trying to see if this model will work first before mm -hmm. giving it away. And I have to pay the teachers, so I'd have to make money through the ads. I'd have to pay the teachers. So. Yeah, I mean, my point being that there might be people willing to be a teacher without pay uh, for this kind of thing. So. Yeah, there is I, did get, I did get quite a bit of pushback from teachers when I offered the first five minutes free. Like a bunch of them are like, I'm not doing this for free. Like I'm not doing this <laughs> stuff. But, <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, That's all the time we got. Thank all right. And our next presentation is UV. And so Peter Forhan is here to present UV. UV is laundry with light. Unbelievable is their tagline. And so, personal fun fact about Peter while he's getting set up here with the time machine, which is what he's going to do. Uh, actually, is that uh, he has created recorder video montages across eight countries, and recorder as in like a flute, he says. So, recorder video montages in eight countries. So, follow up maybe with him afterwards to see that after we see his great pitch. Amazing. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, everyone he out here for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. My name is Peter. Um, I'm an inventor, I'm a dancer, uh, and I'm also a proud engineering alumni from the University of Michigan, so go blue. Uh, quickly, a uh, show of hands, who has done laundry in the last 26 days? One, two, three, everyone's done laundry, perfect, but terrible, absolutely terrible, because laundry is absurd if we think about it. We are modern humans doing laundry that was invented in 1850. No matter how dirty our clothing is, whether it's barely worn, like everyone's clothing right now, or completely soiled like you fell in the mud, we clean it in the same way, literally a chemical bath, followed by 50 minutes of drying. It's insane. Um, separate than all the environmental impacts, which are huge and I'll get to, it costs on average $2.12 per cycle. It's like the one thing that everyone agrees is terrible. Um, and yet we spend literal quarters to do it. Um, but luckily, uh, there is a solution. Um, it's bright, it's laundry with light. It sounds unbelievable, but it's absolutely achievable. With simply a 10 minutes clean, energy lean, make it routine laundry machine. You can kind of see it right in front of you. UV cleans all your clothing and belongings in little as 10 minutes with no water, no chemicals, 99.7% less energy than the number one energy star rated washer and dryer appliance. And it costs like 200 bucks. It's insane. Um, and I'm walking living proof. Uh, if any of you notice anything weird about me, uh, besides my, my stain, um, is that I have not cleaned these clothing, this clothing, this outfit, in a washer and dryer in over 26 days, underwear and socks included. I expected like gasps, because I'm the first human to ever say that sentence. I have not done laundry in over a hundred days with a washer and dryer. I use this thing once or twice a day. It's absolutely insane. It's gonna get a whole lot crazier because, yep, it also does do a greener, do a leaner, dress shirt cleaner, home dry cleaner. Who loves doing dry cleaning? Every suit coat I've seen here, average $12 per cycle. Every dress shirt, $4.50 per cycle. And we all hate it, yep, we all do it. And they're like, pump the brakes, how the freak does that work? I'm gonna get to it. Quick answer is UVC light and ozone, currently used widely across all these industries, um, but for some reason they've never been applied residentially. Um, and it costs about a penny of energy per cycle, really crazy. And it gets way crazier because also a laundry polisher, smell them washer, chore accomplisher, everything washer, not just laundry. You name it, we can clean it because not a person, people, or play. Pet, how do you clean your laptop? You don't. How do you clean that beautiful bag? I wipe it with my sock. Amazing. <laughs> how do you clean it? You can clean anything in here in le as little as 10 minutes with almost, with no additives. Purely close it and I'll put it up. I'm talking watches, laptops, phones, hats, gloves, winter coats. My coat fell in a bar this weekend on Saturday into a puddle of beer. And this is a real story. I was, I was, I saw one of the people here. I clean it. 
Uh, a beer soaked coke, that would normally be a KO, and it takes like, it died 15 minutes, it's crazy. Um, it's gonna get crazier because it's also the only sustainable way to do laundry outside of just not doing laundry. Um, I can get way more into this in questions. If you wanna hear about sustainability, ask me, I'm happy to discuss it. Um, it's a uh, germ combat, it does that, buy me that laundromat, which means no more laundromat walking. You put this thing in your room once. I constructed this about 10 minutes before uh, you guys walked in, and it plugs into a wall. There's no water line, there's no waistline, that's crazy. Um, because we are now modern humans, we're not like digging in dirt and like every day we're like, I need to remove these stains from my clothing with, with chemicals that would kill me if I drink them. No, you just need to zap them with light and, uh, and gas. And yes, it, like, it really works. Um, um, it's also a way cheaper, clean, deeper germ for housekeeper. Um, anecdote alert, but when I was a student, I would do like, clean my towels like, maybe once a semester, um, which is gross, but it's also because it cost me 16 quarters physical quarters to do my to do my towel like, i'm not going to put half my laundry basket to do a towel and it costs 16 quarters the only thing these quarters for is gumballs and laundry and we're like okay with this that's like 1930 mentality like you're using physical money to do something that there's two of in a whole laundry building that are dirty and yet the whole laundry the whole apartment building is like this is fine we're gonna put it in all right great science um i'm back my background is materials engineering uh, i love the science part of it um, I'm happy to dive into it more. Quickly though, because I have a minute, UV light, ozone, UV light, boom. All right, ozone's currently used to, have you ever wondered, how do NHL players clean all that equipment and jersey and everything? They use ozone, they put it in the chamber and pump it full of ozone. Chances are, Sam, sorry, but your jacket is not as dirty as an NHL player's hockey equipment, and they clean that with ozone in 30 minutes. Why are we not doing that with our clothing? All right, and that's the ozone cycle. Um, ozone is really cool how to make it. It's the same way that ozone are made from the sun. In which, and the answer is UV light, as in UV, as in UVC light, which is also the other benefit, because if you have any, any clean anything without ozone, bum -ba -dum, is that it just does that. Have you ever heard of phone soap or any products that clean your stuff with UVC light? Um, wastewater, or, uh, drinking water treatment, uh, phone soap, um, uh, dentist equipment, hospital equipment, hospital rooms, they zap it with 254 nanometer UVC light, and it breaks the bonds of DNA. Um, rapidly in about two minutes exposure. That's my time. Questions? <laughs> yes? Does it fade or weaken the clothes? What's that? Uh, does the UV light and ozone, does it fade or weaken the clothes? Um, not yet. Uh, theoretically, it was going to, but I've done stress cycles. Um, quick answer is that the amount of energy required to break uh, the bonds in DNA of microorganisms and bacteria, and the amount of energy to break chemical bonds and dyes are like a factor of a thousand difference, so no. Um, if it did, there's very easy ways to microscope the effect to make it not happen, but so far I haven't had to do that yet. Yes? Um, so what, what major are you in engineering? So I graduated, but I was materials engineering, um, and two of my classes were in quantum engineering. And this is very basic stuff, I can explain it with like fists, like light hits oxygen, o oxygen breaks into two, that bonds to ozone. Uh, or another oxygen makes ozone, but my background is materials engineering, a couple of classes in quantum, and I'm, uh, I've been involved in startups for a couple of years. Um, until, uh, well, not until, this is also, this is a startup. And but yeah. also, um, so does it, like, what type of stains does it not remove? Like, no stains, like, yes. Okay. Wonderful question, because the best part of this product is we are not replacing a washer and dryer. Did you stain your clothing? Awesome, that's why we have a washer and dryer. Did you wear clothing like a normal human being and not stain it? Boom, 85% of your laundry, put it in here. If you have a stain, exhibit A, 26 days, it's not gonna go away. Um, that's fine, I've used a tad to go pen twice, and that was all it took to not do laundry for 100 days. Okay. Couple things, yes. take a breath. I you yeah, great inventors. I love how zany crazy you are. We didn't talk numbers. I love that market or viability. That will come. I was also an ore nurse, so I really, you know, think about germs and transfer and all that kind of stuff. You were, you were a, sorry? Operating room nurse, so. Okay. <laughs> previous slide. Yes. Okay. I want to invite you to my inventors group, but I also want to talk to you about where you're going with your business plan. One, I'm so glad you asked. So on Friday, I just funded or over the wreck of the nurse by Ann Spark. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's an insane amount of ways to take this product. Um, I'm talking like solar panels on third world countries level of like they clean their clothes in rivers that have human waste in them just to scrape on a you know, or a solar panel, UVC light, ozone outside. Like that's one way. Every single retail store that you like try clothing on, you're like, this didn't work for me. And they're like, great, going back on the rack. You're like, wait, wait, what? No, zap it. Um, so there's a thousand ways of having to discuss them all. Do you have any orders or do you need any orders? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I have, I, I hand built these currently. Spark, I mean, is there, so Spark is Friday, so. the whole plan 
like how much money you need, like what's your ask, how many, you know. Yes, I have all that, um, but I'll show you. Okay, I love to talk. <laughs> is, um, is there any physical danger with this thing? It's a kid. Absolutely, yes. Up. The mechanisms in here are really dangerous that are happening. Um, ozone is, is toxic. It's, it's an amazing cleaning agent, highly unstable, highly dangerous. This is dangerous in the same way a microwave is dangerous. Microwaves are, would kill you. They boil your blood. But microwaves aren't dangerous. Everything inside is self-contained, light tight, air tight. So yes, if you, well, there's safety features built in. But if, if your goal was to, was to kill someone with this, um, you could lock so like it, it, it could theoretically be achieved, but in the same way that you could like kill your cat with a microwave, um, and it's very easy to like. So so the mechanisms are dangerous. The the unit the product is not dangerous. I've been using it in a room with no window um, for a hundred days now, um, and I seem totally normal. <laughs> <laughs> the new factor. What about the underwear? Questions? Yes, right. Here. Um, this is obviously being used in other places. You mentioned. NHL jerseys and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, do you know anybody else trying to take it to a consumer market like you? No, and I'm amazed that it's not. Um, because if I was ever somewhere where they, I put my hockey jersey in a thing and 30 minutes later it's completely deodorized, I'd be like, what the heck just happened with that? Why am I going to knowing that from all my laundry? The closest things that exist in both, so ozone and UVC, it can do both cycles. And it's really cool, no one asked me about science, but it's really cool how that works. We haven't discussed with anyone who's interested. Um, but there's, those things are currently used separately in different applications. Again, uh, phone consumer products, cleaning phone, um, ozone over here, cleaning hockey equipment, uh, UVC light, cleaning drinking water. Um, what's crazy is that there's two different bulbs. They create different levels of, one creates ozone, one creates germicidal light, and the germicidal light also breaks ozone back down into oxygen, which is awesome. It's also not used anywhere. It's part of the, um, oh, also, uh, uh, this is patent pending um, as well. I don't think I mentioned that. Um, so, so to make landed pots, if I were to place an order right now with the four factories, it would cost $50 landed pots. For reference, the average washer and dryer system costs a consumer like $1,200 to $1,800. This could easily retail for like $200 bucks and no one would blink an eye. Um, and it could, a wooden version or a metal version could retail like $500 and no one would blink an eye. Um, because you'll literally save money. If you spend $200 bucks on this and you do 85% less laundry, the average person will save money by buying one within a year. Crazy. All right, that's all the time we got. Stop. Thank you. So our last pitch of the night is project presenter. And uh, while Jason's coming up, let me introduce him. Jason Carpenter is pitching. And project presenter is a PR distribution system for sending and receiving micro tweet style project news from the companies doing the project to news media and trade websites based on the characteristics and metadata about the project. And that is a brutal act to follow. I do not have that kind of energy. Uh, quick bit about me. Um, my name is Jason Carpenter. Uh, I've been developing software professionally for about nine years. Previous to, uh, to that, a lot of sales and marketing in the construction industry, actually. So, merging those backgrounds, um, social media posts by professional service uh, firms like construction companies uh, have an interesting characteristic. Many of them, in fact about half of them, are all related to their projects that they're currently working on. Uh, like posts like, hey we just cleared out this new, uh, this new lot for the new spec hole we're building, or uh, great progress on the automation project we're working on, blah blah blah, with photos and videos and so on. So this is the way that the industry has begun to really talk about the things that they're working on. So that poses an interesting problem. They're producing tweet-style project uh, news, but uh, their target market isn't necessarily their followers. A lot of times it's just other companies they work with, to be honest. Uh, and social, or news sites like uh, 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 MLive and so on and so forth, and trade associations, uh, they're not really, they're, there's no scalable way for them to consume and use that type of, of news in that format or that frequency. So the solution is Project Presenter. It is a collection and distribution system specific to uh, what I call micro project news or social project news. They tend to be a little lighthearted. Uh, so Project Presenter will actually pull in your posts from like your Facebook uh, feed, sort out the ones that are project news and news about you know uh, somebody had a baby in the office. Uh, 
and actually combine that with metadata about the project. So uh, if, if a project type, project industry, um, square footage, if it is a building, uh, geographic location as well, and then present you with the distribution channels that match based on that project information, your company information, uh, like the, the trade associations and, tra and, and journals um, and news organizations. So uh, this is live, this is a real live post. So, uh, so this company goes through the process, they, they're breaking ground into a new uh, ice cream shop in cold water and using the system, bam, it's published out to their trade organization that uh, it's geocoded with the various it's categorized and it's collected with other similar type of posts. So collectively, this begins to tell a story about what's happening in, in that organization in that area. So that company is now getting uh, analytics information, their targeted exposure on a credible site. Um, SEO wise, they're, they're putting out lots of backlinks into domain authority sites. And it actually organizes the standards. They're tweeting over time. It's building a portfolio that actually can feed and populate their website because it has the plugins and, and APIs and everything that, uh, that they need. So they're able to reuse that data as well. So um, distribution channels, like the, the, the news websites and so on. Um, they can charge a fee for their subscription, so it's a new revenue source for them. Some of them are actually opening it up for free. Um, they can manually approve these posts as they come in, just to give a quick eye, or they can say, this company is trusted, we're gonna go ahead and automate this. Um, and they can even set requirements, like anything that comes in here has to have uh, a photo and some square footage information or, or things of that nature. So it, it does automate their end of, of receiving this. Uh, the freemium model, there's a basic uh, $0 per month that gives you one channel that you can plug into. Uh, the premium is unlimited channels uh, at $38 a month, but uh, the individual channels um, can charge. So some of them might be free, some of them like, uh, like uh, MIBiz is uh, $49 a month. So running short on time, uh, going to uh, the acquiring customers, trade associations are key, then uh, targeted ads into the social networks right where those people are, are posting this type of information. Um, got some traction, these are actually pretty significant companies, big companies in West Michigan, 16 paying companies, three trade groups, and uh, one news site already, and uh, hoping to hear on MLive tomorrow actually. Um, and the ask here at the end, the team, oh my God, I need help. So this is like a tidal wave coming in on me and I've built the app, I'm doing the sales, I'm doing the marketing, everything. I'm looking for a Ruby person that's great, a sales marketing person that's great. I want to share the company and build that founding team. Thank you. Questions for Jason? Looks like it was airtight. <laughs> Come on, someone. Back corner, right. It uh, takes that idea that social media is such an ocean of useless information, and you're driving that information to a specialized stream of people that actually want it. So companies define your, your environment, your college, and you're doing that data um, But as it's getting forward, pushed through your system to uh, end magazine or end news, Entity um, does it allow for biactual like uh, conversation and discussion. So, say something you post might be suitable for like IBM, and it gets like an IBM newsletter or a computer newsletter. Can I then, as an IBM employee, respond to it and actually respond to the original author of that post? As as like the distribution channel and, and say, oh, we like that, but you've got to add a little more information or yeah. So so yes, that does have that. Okay. Yeah, we do have the ability to reject with a note, you know, asking for a little more information. Um, okay. Some, some, some. So far, some places have been like, it doesn't matter what these people are sending us, whether we trust them, and others are really controlling that. Uh, or, or more important, say you, you post something in this ocean of social media. I get it because my company uh, subscribes to Project Presenter, and as an employee of this company, I actually want to respond to your Facebook post. And I send something back to you upstream. Not currently, no. Okay, other questions?
Right here. Yeah, can you explain more like the need and market growth right. for this sort of thing? So it's, it, it's all boils down to marketing. These people are producing news and, and P, essentially PR, and they're pushing it through what tends to be very limited eyeballs um, in, their, in their social feeds. So what we're doing is they can simply plug this in, and now they're distributing what, what we, we might have done uh, 10 years ago with a PR release to the local newspaper when you hire somebody. Now they have a complete channel, a direct channel, into publishing this content out to the local news sites and so forth. So, for example, Architect uh, in West Michigan has got a lot of new projects uh, in Detroit. They want to get on the cranes and publish out all the updates uh, of, of their big new project that we're doing. Question here? Yeah. Who are the main competitors for this? I mean, what comes to mind is sort of like Google Ads and how they work with companies to push content. But, right. Yeah. Yeah, the Google, and so that's, so right, the difference is, is format. Um, these sites, the news organizations are set up to, you're a battery ad or you're a content uh, full article. It's, it's, it's A or B. And this idea of these shorter two sentence updates on local projects going on, um, there's really no mechanism, uh, yet there's a lot of content. So. Other questions? Thank All you. Right, thank you. All right, well, great pitches, everyone. Thanks, everyone, who pitched and for the good questions. Um, so now it's time for our community announcements. So if you have a community announcement you'd like to make, go ahead and line up in front of this whiteboard over here. Um, so this is a time you can make an announcement about an event you want to promote or a position you're hiring for, a position you're looking for yourself, um, a collaborator you're looking for on a project, etc. Um, so please keep your announcements to one to two minutes. Um, so keep them brief so we can move through them quickly. And if you'd like, you can also write your information on this whiteboard over here once you're finished. So if someone wants to get in touch with you, you can put an email there, phone number, website, etc., whatever, um, so they can follow up with you. So without further ado, uh, each person when you're announcing, make sure to stand right up here in front of this little recorder. That way they can get you on the video. And I'll also turn the screen off while we do that. But first person can come on up and then just everyone come up one at a time after that. In the right spot. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's hard to follow all those great pictures that we just saw, but um, I just wanted to come up quickly and say that um, we are currently seeking a technical co founder to um, help us lead solving a major data problem in the waste and recycling space. Um, without giving you a full pitch here, if that's something that you're interested in helping us with, um, come and see me and I'll put my information to the board as well. Um, this is an exciting project. We have a lot of momentum behind it. We're going to take all of the infusion out of waste and recycling. We're going to help companies get their things properly disposed of and create the world's very first um, real-time picture of consumption patterns. And um, and so that's, that's all the exciting action. We got machine learning, AI, we got Lots of complex dynamic database needs, um, and then of course the front end of presenting that to people in a usable educational way. Who's, so, who's we? What you said, we company name, me, and a consortium of people behind us to be named. All yeah. right, to be named. Thank you. Thanks. How are you doing? My name is Adam Smitty. I'm an MBA here at the University of Michigan. I'm also the CEO and a co-founder of a platform called Your Check. And what we're trying to do is create a platform that allows anyone to get a background check for any reason and give it to anyone else that they may want to. And what I'm looking for, my ask is, is that if you are developing a company or have your own entrepreneurship where you are hiring people or making decisions about uh, people around you and want a background check, we're looking for sort of testers, some alpha users, get some good user feedback and maybe partner in the future if you are developing an app where you are running through a lot of people for say volunteering or whatnot in a possible revenue sharing model with our background checks. I have my message up here, thanks. Good evening, everyone. I'm Krish, a frequent uh, attendee. Good evening, everyone. I'm Krish. I visit this event frequently. Pleased to see many familiar faces. 
Uh, I have a few questions about VBA programming in Excel. I'm trying to automate this PowerPoint presentation for a real estate firm. So if anyone knows VBA programming, uh, you know, please let me know. And uh, I'm hoping you can help me out. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Ravi Mukirala. We have a startup which is very close to closing some clients. And so at this stage, we are still PC, but looking for investors or people to help close government contracts. So I'm going to put my email right here. And uh, please feel free to contact me if there is any interest. I'm Jesse Halfon. I'm a automotive products liability attorney at Dykema, but my current interest is more in micromobility. Um, so I've written a couple things on safety or and product liability issues around electric scooters and City Lab. Everybody and their mother has written a think piece on electric scooters at this point, but mine are the best, so you should <laughs> check them out if you're interested. They're informative and funny, in my opinion. Um, but I'm here because I have a pending patent that I'm working on for uh, basically a device that you could add on to an electric scooter, either as a retrofit or incorporated into the actual device. Um, I've spoken to a couple people from the industry to see if it's the dumbest idea ever, and it's not, apparently it's not. So if you know anything about 3D printing or prototyping or uh, vehicle aerodynamics in general, there we go. Hello, good evening. Hi, Sam. Thank you for that greeting. I'm Natalie Bruno, and I work for Jotful, and we are reimagining the way that small business owners make and maintain their websites. And in June of this year, we also took over the business of one of our customers, which is a co-working space in Ann Arbor. It's called Cowork Ann Arbor. It is the least expensive co-working space. It also has prime real estate being at Maine and Liberty, which is phenomenal. We um, happen to also be in a basement, but we have the best real estate option and we are $35 a month if you want to come one day a week at the low end, and we are 125 a month if you want to come all five days a week. And there are three of us at Jotful that sort of run the space. We also have another eight to 10 co-working members depending on the month. One of those is actually somebody you might know, which is Brian Kelly, who I know used to come here a lot. Um, so we are looking for another maybe five to eight people. Um, we're friendly, we're colorful, we're joyful. I'll write my information up there, thank you. Drew Purnell, I'm in need of a technical co-founder to uh, with uh, Ruby's on Rails experience as well as website experience in general uh, to help me launch my platform. Uh, more details to follow. I'll put my information here. Hey, my name's Diane. I'm here um, to just tell you about two upcoming events. Uh, one of them you were perhaps going to mention, but just making sure Tech Homecoming is coming up by Spark. It's the day before Thanksgiving. So if you're in town for Thanksgiving, you should definitely show up. Uh, it's going to be at Cahoots. The other one is for folks who are vaguely interested or from the biomedical industries. Um, there's, a, there's a bio mixer. It's on December 3rd. It's going to be monthly. This is going to be the third one. Uh, December 3rd at Pretzel Bell from 6 to 8. So if you're in the biomedical industries, show up. Good to see you. Hi, I'm Dan. Uh, I was a mechanical engineer for about 10 years. I worked in automotive. I worked in big oil and big energy. And I got tired of that. I taught myself how to program. And now I'm about to celebrate two years as an independent consultant focused on data analysis and business intelligence. Uh, I have room for an additional project. Um, let me know if you have a project uh, I might be able to work on with you. Um, if you know someone, maybe we can discuss a commission. Should I be issued a PO? Uh, when I'm not doing that, I'm working on a project involving non-traditional statistics in the NFL. That's a lot of fun to me. And then why not, I'll tell you. I, I produce a stand-up comedy and music show, so 
Let me know if uh, you need some data analyzed, some business intelligence, or if uh, you want to hear about some cool comedians and musicians in town. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Shane. Uh, I was up here last month promoting myself as a <clears throat> startup attorney, and that's still true. Um, so if anybody needs any, any work on that, let me know. Um, but I told my friend I would promote his business this, this month. Uh, he owns his own financial services company. He helps early stage companies and other high growth um, startups with anything from building financial models all the way to outside CFO services, um, as well as M&A banking, if anybody is um, at that stage. So if you need legal or finance, let me know. Thanks. I want to bullet point and just put out in here to the space and let you know that I'm president of the Inventors Association Metro Detroit. Our monthly meeting is at Lawrence Tech on Thursday. You can sign up really easily through Meetup. So I know like 141 people signed up to be here for Meetup. So check it out. Join <laughs> us. So that's that's the meeting. Okay. And I am also campaigning for a job I applied for and it's a .gov. And I want to be your educational outreach coordinator. I want to work with Spark. I want to work with Southeast Michigan, the whole network of universities. And what we do very well here through our USPTO satellite in Detroit is going to extrapolate into nine states. So I will be traveling to the UP, and I'll be traveling to Minnesota, down to Missouri and Ohio and Kentucky. And I want to engage, and I want to be there as that resource for you. And I want to take inventors like that and really give them the opportunity to shine. Thank you. What's the name of the meetup again? The meetup is the Inventors Association of Metro Detroit. Okay. And that's uh, Lawrence Tech, 630. And I am baking sister pie recipes Ooh. for thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Aditi. I'm Omed. Uh, I'm currently working on an idea. Uh, it's currently just an idea. So have, have you guys ever read a research paper in your life? It's very hard to make a sense out of a research paper or with all the knowledge available today on internet, it's very difficult to grasp everything. So the overall idea is to spend few minutes and get a grasp of any new research or any new technology in few minutes. Um, it's a community-based community application and I'm looking for people who could work on this idea or want to co contribute in any way possible. Yeah, anyone with like any uh, background in like, uh, you know, launching a startup or uh, people with, you know, technical skills or and whatnot. We'll leave our information up here. Okay. Hi, I'm Brian Pickering. I'm the CEO owner of Oil Uber. If you haven't got your car's oil changed while you sat here, it's because I'm not running yet. <laughs> uh, I'm open to all contacts. We're new C Corp. Uh, I'll put my information on the board and uh, background checks. I'm very interested in. Thank you. Um, I realize I didn't explicitly say I'm looking for both uh, investors as well as talent, um, including student summer talent. If you're looking for internships, um, this was a graphic I wrote before. But no matter how dirty your clothes are, it's all it's all one conglomerate. But yes, so both investment for uh, purely an inventory run. Um, I had the factories lined up already, um, as well as uh, everything you saw is I, I like just fumble around with Illustrator and, and web design and everything. Um, so I'm looking for people who actually like, don't fumble around to like make it sweet. So talk to me. Yes. So hey guys, other than the company that I was talking about earlier, I'm also a digital design consultant. So I know a lot of you raised your hand saying you were looking for people for design. So I do like UI, UX, Illustrator, stuff like that. So let me know also. Uh, hey everybody, I'm looking for a couple of software development teams who run sprint retrospectives uh, who might be interested in trying a new tool I'm working on. Let me know. Thanks. Alrighty. Thanks for the announcements, everyone. Um, so as we wrap up tonight, I um, want to remind you that we're always, our A2 New Tech meetup is always on the third Tuesday of each month. So our next meetup will be this Tuesday, December 17th. Um, so we'd love to see you back here for that. We do have spaces open for pitches. Um, so if you want to pitch, reach out to us. You can email us at organizers at a2newtech.org. 
That's organizers at a2newtech.org. Uh, we're working on getting a bigger pipeline set up so we have more companies um, ready to pitch each month. And so we'd love to hear from you. We'll add you in there and let you know um, if you're at the right stage to pitch. Generally what we look for in companies that are gonna pitch um, is that you've done some customer validation, you've spoken with some prospective customers, and hopefully you've built a prototype as well. Um, it can be pretty simple in a lot of cases to build some kind of prototype to show what your idea is, and so we encourage you to do that. Uh, but no matter what stage you're at, feel free to reach out and we'll let you know and talk to you about kind of where you need to be in order to be, to be pitching, or we'll get you signed up to pitch in a future month. Um, again, I remind you to go to madeina2.com slash slack to join the tech community um, slack channel for Ann Arbor, madeina2.com slash slack. And make sure to check out that director of companies at madeina2.com as well. Um, you may find out about some things you haven't known about before. Uh, show of hands, who's planning to join us at Pizza House after this? Okay, looks like a healthy group of folks. Um, so that's at 618 Church Street after this, and our Spark is providing pizza, so hopefully see you at Pizza House. Thanks, everybody.